call the meeting to order and maybe Beth will join. So meeting call to order at 704. You're Evan, right? And yep. John Coleman, Alyssa, Alyssa and Shannon. I'm not going to stay the whole time. Okay. Uh, so up first, the meeting minutes of March 1st. Any discussion or any comments on those meeting minutes? Move to approve. Second. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained. Meeting minutes of March 1st are approved. Uh, next was uh, the last thing we talked about. Um, we had the, our guest presenter and talked a lot about um, sulfur and acid rain and things going on in the pond. And uh, Mr. Coleman has uh, wanted to expand on that a little bit more and, and add a couple more points to it. Um, I think everybody got slides and email earlier. So, yeah, I, I've uh, been looking around for, you know, something that's happening uh, around White Pond that could, that's changed in the last, say, 20 years, so that that would explain why, you know, there hasn't been a venture in the past and now there is. I mean, is there anything out there that's changed? And uh, I've been looking at acid and a big contributor to acid deposition, so that's out of the atmosphere and rainfall, you know, acid rain and so forth. A big contributor to that is sulfur. Um, in the form of sulfuric acid actually comes out of uh, coal fired power plants and also nitric acid, which comes, I think, a lot from automobiles uh, combustion. Uh, and both those things have been addressed um, to try and, you know, scale back on acid rain, basically. And there have been scrubbers put in on. Uh, uh, on the power plants and their catalytic converters, I think, or just the um, what's going on with cars. And uh, I noticed that so every year there's a national atmospheric deposition program that has stations all over the country. And every year they put out a summary. And in um, 2014, made the cover what I'm talking about. And that's the difference between uh, the amount of uh, sulfuric acid and nitric acid that's come down in the past, and then what is is on now, so you can see the difference. Uh, this is uh, uh, what it what it has been in the past, and here it seems to have cleaned up quite a bit. So actually, I have uh, there's the uh, NADP group, the National Atmospheric Deposition Program group, has these cool uh, PowerPoint slides that show this. Uh, if I can get it to work here. Um, and how how do I get this up on the screen then? Uh, go back into Zoom. Yep. I'm here, Abby. Hey Beth, welcome. John just started uh taking us through his thoughts on sulfuric and nitric acid. So sure screen. Oh. Yeah, so share screen and they should be able to pick which window you want to share. You should be able to pick it from where you were. Oh. So now that is camera on. Go back to Zoom. Yeah, and then click share. Oh, yeah. yeah. There we go. Okay. So here's sulfate. So here's sulfate moving. Uh, from the 1980s into the present time, you can see the amount of sulfur in the eastern part of the country. 
it's just decreasing, but I don't see it up on the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Looks like it's sharing here. It's sharing. You got. You, I. I can see it. Oh, great! You're seeing it change. You're I'm. Seeing... I'm, I'm seeing the slide. Uh, it looks like slide eleven. Hydrogen ion concentration is pH 2019 slide. Uh, yeah, not not. We're on a sulfate ion deposition on his screen. Did you do? Um, it says enable editing, and go into slideshow mode. So on the, the yellow, on the yellow bar, allow enable editing. Right here, on the just below the red, in the white. Yeah. Level. So right. if you if you push enable editing, it will let you start uh, managing it. It's protected right now. Can you see what I mean, John? Uh, we we did that and then we went away and we're in slide mode on his computer, but it's not. Huh. That's not what's showing up on your screens. So you put you put in a share screen, and you're able to advance the slides on your end. I mean, yeah. I think we're, I think it's just frozen. I think maybe you should try to stop sharing screen and reshare the screen. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah, and so let's just try it again. Share screen down yeah, here. Correct. Which window you want? Yeah, let's see which ones we got. Hope it's this one. No, oh, that's pH. This is kind of silly because. Okay, uh, it progress. moved. It moved. Progress. And if you would use the arrows, do your slides advance? If you use your arrow keys. Um, yeah. yeah. There we go. Okay, going the wrong way now. <laughs> but we're moving. We get it. We get it. We're moving. So anyway, it was bad in the old days. It was. <laughs> it's way, you're in the way back machine there. Okay, so you see how red it is, but. Also that, okay, now it's going automatically for some reason. So uh, it's not just New England, it's not just Massachusetts, but the whole Eastern part of the country had this big difference in sulfate. But again, it's sulfate, which was actually sulfuric acid. And I could, if I now went back to the, um, the uh, acid slide, you could see that the acid is decreasing quite a bit. Although I'm not sure that I'll be able to get it. Yeah. So share. What did I what did I do before? <laughs> share screen. And I'm uh, looking for this more. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so here's the acid one. And again, it's um, down at the end. So this is the way it, it ends up present day. It starts out. Uh, is it more acidic in red? Red is more acidic. So red is about four, pH four. And here's 1985. And as we move towards uh, the present day, you can see that acid is going down. This is 2008, 2010. And this is measured in what? In 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 the precipitation or in the precipitation? Yeah. So it's wet precipit. It's it's wet precip, not dry fall. Okay. So um, I'm thinking. Um, yeah, the acid, you know, is is uh, going away. Things are becoming more basic. How would that affect cyanobacteria? Well, it turns out that 
um, phosphorus in the aquifer moves much more easily and much more efficiently at higher pHs. In other words, when it's more basic than it does at acidic. And we, we're sort of not used to that because with acid rain, the whole problem was uh, leaching ions out of the aquifer, leaching calcium, leaching all the nutrients away and so forth. But phosphorus is different, it's a negative ion, and it is more tightly bound to the solids in the aquifer when the pH is low, and it is released when the pH is high. Okay, so, you know, that could be uh, what's going on. Wow, in the last 20 years, pH has gone up by a whole unit, uh, which is a factor of 10 because that's because pH is on a log unit. And that would release the phosphorus, which has been stuck in the aquifer from all the septic systems around Light Pond for, you know, since, you know, maybe 50, 100 years ago. And that would explain why things are getting more uh, uh, eutrophication or more uh, cyanobacteria in the pond. Um, however, Another thing I was, I was asked to do was to look into the um, historical, you know, volunteer database because it stopped in about 2018. And the volunteers continued to collect the data, but it wasn't ever graphed up. And so Beth asked me, like, what's up with that? And I graphed that up. And here it is on my screen. It's not here. Okay, so this is mostly the old data that Bill Walker graphed up um, of such a disk. So it's the depth that you can see black and white disk in the water. So a, a bigger number is clearer water. Um, so it's measured in meters and it ranges, you know, from like three meters to, I don't know, eight or so meters. And on this slide, uh, Bill is, is put in the median value, what it is most often, or that's, the median would be when the depth is uh, equally a number of, of uh, observations that are below the median and, and, and an equal number above. That's what the median is. John, ex excuse me for a second. Can you go to yeah. full screen on yours so I can see those data points better, please? I can try and. Uh, it's got that Adobe whole column over there. Thank you. That help at all? A little, yeah. Can you go bigger? It, it's trying to get rid of that right side uh, panel. I don't know why it's in there. Okay, thanks. And how do so I this is it? this okay. is Bill Walker's. Not bottom. We haven't added to it yet. Yeah. You okay. okay. I see. I see it. Okay. Thank you. Um. Yeah. So hidden in here is the part that I did. I can bring it over. Yeah. Uh, those big dots are are just the last four years that I added on there. Um, and the scales match up and everything. But you can see that, it, if anything, the, the SETI disk is increasing in those last three years. So, and these are, in general, you know, around six, between six and eight. That's a pretty clear lake. And I would uh, say that it's indicative of an, of an oligotrophic lake. In any case, what I, you know, that hypothesis that the pH would change the phosphorus availability and that would make the thing more eutrophic, it just doesn't play out uh, from you looking at these data. But it seems kind of constant. What, what does oligotrophic mean? Uh, oligotrophic is, means it's uh, not, doesn't have a lot of plant nutrients. So, um, and and it's supposed to eutrophic, which means it's you know really well fed uh, with with uh, plant nutrients. So if it's oligotrophic, which I'm sort of seeing here, it's real clear. That means there's not much algae. Um, so what's up with this hypothesis that there's more phosphorus coming in? Yeah. See what I'm saying? We also have that ESS data where they they put in um, you know probes um, that show there wasn't much phosphorus input um they did it they right so 
So they and and they're all evaluated. Not in 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 the sand uh, going into the pond. So the pour water. So their whole assessment, um, you know, how much phosphorus is in this pond compared to the flow through and so forth. They came up with sort of uh, a comparison of that amount of phosphorus with standards for ponds that, you know, when they're in trouble, when they're okay, or when they're, you know, uh, in, in even better condition. And they kind of concluded that, you know, White Pond, this was, you know, back when they did their study, of course, was not particularly, uh, again, eutrophic, but uh, well-fed with um, plant nutrients. So, you know, it's like, they, that's their conclusion. So the Sechi disc is, is you know, this, the clarity of the water is good. Um, and then there's more data, the oxygen data, also I updated. Don, while you're uh, grabbing that next slide, were you able to use on um, all this comparison walkers, like his uh, his same methodology? And I only asked because he had said he was at some point going to update his slides, and I don't know if it's worth it if you've already done that. Well, all I did was add the data that he didn't graph. Okay, um, same scale, same, same same tool. Same scale. Now, I don't have his raw data, so I just took a snapshot of his picture and pasted mine next to it and adjusted the scales so that they're the same. Okay. And that's what, that's okay. what I've done here okay. also. Thank you. Uh, it's going to show. Yes. Here's the oxygen. <laughs> Getting me a tech whiz here. I don't know why it's so hard. Um, yeah, so on the right is uh, the new data the last four years. And on the left is older data that Again, Bill uh, grew up in these oxygen profiles. They all have the bulge just below the um, thermal pine, which is indicative of oxygen uh, produced by the deep growing algae, the nitella, that is abundant in this lake. Um, and, you know, it's still there in the, in the recent years. And then uh, deeper in the water, uh, there's not so much light, algae can't grow. So they don't produce oxygen. In fact, the uh, degradation, the uh, bacteria take over and, and are eating up the algae that rains down from the surface. So oxygen is used and that's why deeper the oxygen can go all the way to zero. But it's, it's not, if you look at the dates and everything on these profiles, it's not going, uh, it's not decreasing in the deep water faster in the more recent data than it was in, in the historic data. So again, I don't see an indication of a lot more algae growing now than was in the past, which you know, sort of matches up with the Sechi disk, because Sechi disk isn't changing. So there isn't probably more algae forming. Um, and so then what's up with uh, the fact that we're getting cyanobacteria now when we didn't have it before? And I was really kind of scratching my head. I, I searched around the literature online and I found this paper that was talking about cyanobacteria happening in oligotrophic lakes, which is kind of, I think, the situation that we have um, at White Pond. And I'll stop there. They kind of ended up just scratching their heads. And this, and this uh, cyanobacteria thing? Yeah. Uh, in, in the oligotrophic lakes. So here's here's a nice title anyway. Cyanobacteria blooms in oligotrophic lakes, shifting the nutrient paradigm. So you're kind of into it. It's a recent paper. That's good. Um, of course, you can't read it, but... Uh, More authors than pages. <laughs> what so, what year, I, John? What year is this one? Twenty-one. 
2021. Okay. Yeah, I think we submitted this to the uh, fishing game. And interestingly enough, um, they still don't right. care about trout, but go ahead. Here's here's their map of the world and lakes. So this was a con, you know, this was there's a whole bunch of authors. It's because it was a conference that was held in somewhere in Ontario or something. Uh, and they all kind of got together and said, hey, you know, this is happening. What's the deal? They uh and they put out this paper kind of with no data, but just a compilation of their observations that they you know, come from at an international conference. And anyway, you can see a cluster of lakes uh, in New England that they found that are in this condition of cyanobacteria and oligotrophic conditions. And also in Europe, but it's, it's interesting that Europe also had acid rain and they also went after it, put in scrubbers and got rid of it. So, at least that forcing function is in both places. But again, how does it hook up with, uh, you know, the cyanobacteria? And I, I think that in this uh, this paper, I don't listen. They were just stumped. Well, but when you get to the conclusions, they they don't really get any further. They, they talk about phosphorus um, and like, well, how could phosphorus get into like a Lake George and stuff? And they talk about, you know, it happens after. Um, uh, wind events that stir up the, the deeper water and bring in the phosphorus to the, the surface. So I think if anything, it would be that you know, cyanobacteria is present in the, in the ponds, kind of even in the spring, but uh, it doesn't bloom. Other algae can grow faster than cyanobacteria. But once the, set, the um, stratification sets up, the other algae settle out the cyanobacteria can stay in the water column because they have a buoyancy function that they can apply. It keeps them up there. They just keep growing slowly, slowly, slowly through that stratified period. And then if they can get a phosphorus source later on in the stratified period, they'll bloom and come up to the surface. So that's as close as I can come to um, what's going on for uh, white pond because if it's phosphorus coming from the aquifer, it would be delivered in a shallow zone uh, in the apple, in you know above the thermal fine, uh, and it would come in all the time that the groundwater comes in, which is pretty much constant through the year, or maybe accelerate a little bit if there's increased uh, rainfall. Uh, so that would be you know a supply of, of phosphorus that you need in the in the shallow water to make the bloom happen. So that's that's as, as close as I can come to a a mechanism of what's going on. Oh, just let it sit there. If the dry <laughs> if the dry if the pollen dry pollen deposition is a is a more of a significant input, then I mean that that would kind of fit actually that, that you get the input from the pollen. The pollen comes in the spring. And in the fall, it, it doesn't come like it's not right time. high at uh, July or uh, or August. It comes, you know, it, it, it's real high in the spring and it's real high in the fall. Uh, early mid June, is that when those big clouds of pine pollen? Yeah. Yeah. In the, uh, you know, the first couple of weeks of June, usually. Which yeah, where, that's what that's is, one of them. Yeah. Which is when Nancy found that. Big growth of uh, this cyanobacteria. So, but we also have to remember, as John and Nancy both mentioned two weeks ago, these nutrients and things that may be having an impact are, you know, refeeding themselves. Sulfur was one example. I think I forwarded uh, that information to everybody. Um, so, we just have to be mindful of that, how things recycle in the environment. So pollen comes in the spring, comes in the fall, doesn't mean it disappears. Sulfur was there from the industrial revolution. It doesn't mean it disappears, right? So there's so many factors. Yeah, I don't and know I think, that. And John, one more thing I would just add, it's interesting enough that I hear this is not, not factual. You have lived near the pond longer than I. But when I talk to swimmers, that and remember, secchi dish, I'll just I'll say secchi discs are one measurement, right? So the secchi discs have been relatively 
good for years and years and years. And, but the swimmers and fishermen mentioned many times that they think the water clarity is not as good as it was. There's particles, et cetera. So it's always interesting to me because the Secchi hasn't changed that drastically, but the phycocyanin counts do, do change even when the Secchi stays the same. So we just got to remember the system is, you know, there's many inputs and many factors. So Secchi is just one, one mode of measuring clarity, but other things impact the cyanobacteria. Well, there's turbidity data too, that's pretty consistent with the Secchi data. Right, yeah. But the, the chemical measurements and what we're having Nancy Leland do now is getting us even more, more precise data that wasn't really tested. The volunteer, the citizen volunteers were testing for, they were doing phycocyanin, they were doing fluorescence phycocyanin and uh, one other thing, but Nancy's is obviously much more rigorous. So, I mean, that's why that's exciting getting more data from that perspective. What is turbidity? Measure what turbid, how much stuff is in the water. So, how oh, cloudy the water. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> Not a scientist, in case you haven't gone on. <clears throat> but the turbidity instrument will look kind of uh, at a path that's at one depth, uh, it has a light source and a, and a, and a uh, receiver, you know, uh, that's like a meter away from each other. And you can move it up and down and see how that changes. Mm -hmm. Whereas, um, and so that's, so you could, you can identify a particular zone of high uh, turbidity, mm -hmm. whereas you can't really do that from uh, such a disk. All right. Because that just integrated its total count. Yeah. And what did you say Nancy was measuring that was better? Well, she's doing, she's on it. She's doing, uh, Melissa, a two-tiered approach. So she's measuring things like phycocyanin is one. And when she starts seeing counts, when she's watching for trends, and when she starts seeing the trends, that's when they test more frequently. They went from bi-weekly to weekly. And then they also will do an actual cyanobacteria test itself. Those are much more expensive. So she's looking at predictive factors in order not to waste a lot of money um, for that that one you know test that really shows the cyanobacteria. And I think did uh, and Alyssa, thank you so much for doing such a great job on those minutes. I think we have Nancy's report is on the um, watershed website now. So you could look at some of the things. You know, she had all those tables she showed, but I know it was a kind of long presentation, but you could take a look there too. So, so, so John, are you, um, I, are you trying to think about this from a perspective of one of the things we could work on to, to battle or combat the cyanobacteria, or are you thinking one of these things we can rule out and trying to figure out how we can use this data? I'm thinking more in terms of um, how we could combat cyanobacteria. So if if this um, theory that, you know, there is more phosphorus coming in during the stratified period when the cyanobacteria need that extra kick in order to bloom. They, they are present during you know, the entire year, and not only in white pond, they're in all ponds. It's just that you know, some in some conditions, they bloom at, you know, in the hot weather and come up to the surface and cause a, a tremendous nuisance. So it's how do you get that to stop? And I would say it's uh you know, if what I'm talking about is a factor, then you try to uh, get the phosphorus away from the pond that's coming in the groundwater. And the thing is that the phosphorus that's come in from septic systems that's far away from the pond, but still in the contributing area, is probably never going to make it to the pond, even with the less acidic conditions. So you think your old estimate of 40 feet or so, you would drop it down to 
something slightly less. The 40 feet was the unsaturated zone, but I, now I'm talking about just, just linear distance from the pond. So it's it's a combination of how much in saturated zone does the phosphorus have to go through, and then how far does it have to travel once it hits the water table? Like it's slowed down and sticks onto the solid phase in both conditions. But what about uh, the sources then? And then so that that's why I would concentrate on looking at the sources that are very close to the pond and down uh, at the the uh, Kind of the level of the pond. You know what I've been thinking was that what what you happens? Just, they're quite like very close. What does that what does that mean? Well, it's kind of it's kind of uh, they're kind of uh, associated. As you get close to the pond, you also come off the the hill, and you right. and so you 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 know get rid of the forty feet of unsaturated zone. Um, so anything down the hill, you might say. I, is, is where I'd start first. But I, I know I keep going back to this, but the ESS, where they did the poor water data, didn't see much phosphorus. I mean, it was just a snapshot. I'm not sure what's up with that. Um, and, you know, I don't agree with all of their data. Like they got, they kind of said water was coming in from all directions. And that doesn't really happen in the past. Um, so I'm kind of wondering how, how all, you know, that worked out. Um, also, you know, a small concentration, but over a large area can still be significant low. So uh, I'd like to, it might be good to do some more uh, of that kind of, of thing. Also, in the areas where it's most likely to have it, like at the swimming beach, that's where the old um, bathhouses were set up. And there must have been septic systems associated with those. And that's a, an area that I would think would be, you know, most likely to have a problem. And I don't know if, you know, how closely they associate, how they carefully they looked at that. Yeah, well, I did talk to uh, Melanie Deneen, Board of Health, trying to get some data on that old, whether there was just a cesspool or a septic system. And um, she hasn't found anything. Um, she was going to talk to the guys that did the demo because so they saw it. But the new the new tanks that are there are tight tanks. They're they're you know above ground type tanks. So um, we're only looking at residual from those old yeah. outhouses. Is it uh, the old no. septic plans or anything? No. I mean they, they didn't do, they didn't have septic plans <laughs> 20, 50 no. years ago, <laughs> right? No. right? No. I cleaned them enough, but I don't know where the water <laughs> went. The, another thing that ESS you know said is that. There's that state access road, and you know people can come in there and fish and so forth uh, throughout the year. But the the bathrooms aren't really open uh, a lot of the time, and they were ESS was sort of implying that you know people just use the out of doors to relieve themselves. So that is probably going to be down at the level of the lake. That's phosphorus, you know. That's that's uh, an input that could be perhaps uh, gone after by you know putting in some portable toilets or something. I don't know. You know what they might do. Well, COVID, the other end will have 120 people there on a nice day with no facilities. That is another you know place that I think should be addressed. You know, I don't know how you want to do it, but uh, that would be a you know a fast resource for sure. Yeah, I mean, they have the fishermen. Uh, when Kate Hodges was here, she explained that they put the porta potty for the fishermen. And it, I think it's now at the top in the parking lot, how, you know, how often it's used, I don't know, but that was there for the off season. And Evan, you're absolutely right. We've seen those pictures. That's why the rangers or whatever, preventing people and pets from going in the water at the cove was so important, if that's one of the sources. And the year before last, when we had, you know, basically no swimming, that's when there was, and it was also during obviously COVID and hot. I mean, who knows, but that's when we had all those outbreaks really severe. So maybe that's one of our recommendations that if that's, uh, if John, if that's what you're, you're theorizing that 
that phosphorus could be a pretty big impact besides the septic. I understand what you're saying, that we have to do more about preventing that from occurring. It seems like it can't hurt, even if it has nothing to do with the cyanobacteria. You know, what's, what's wrong with, um, with getting facilities so that people don't relieve themselves just wherever, uh, on either end of the park? I mean, that's, that's kind of the way I look at it. But I, but I can also hook it into uh, you know, possible mechanism for there being more cyanobacteria, because this stuff moves a little better now. With the um, with the change in in uh, acidity of the of the uh, precip, and is it is it a material amount? Like how much does it take? Uh, you know, if there's a fisherman per day, or if there's fifty or hundred, uh, not too much. I could do some calculations about that. Wouldn't it be interesting. I mean, in Walden, you found like this huge load in the summertime, but that's I mean, that's a massive. The more you mean, number you mean of people from, peeing. from the um, uh, atmospheric composition or what? No, I meant from people peeing in the you water. Know. Oh, well, that's completely fake. So that that thing uh, got blown way out of proportion. But I was trying to like how how effective could um, you know could swimmers be? Is, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think. All right, so but you're talking about the odd, the odd person on the shore, right? No, I'm trying to think. Like when, right? So one or two people is not going to matter, right? But does you know you can go down to the other end on a hot day, and there's 120 people, and there's babies with diapers, and there's dogs, and there's people right. I think, all day. I think that all could make yeah. a difference, and and um, you know this. Uh, so I, I have worked out my, I mean, you, you, you can figure out how much phosphorus there is in urine and then, you know, uh, how much urine is, you know, uh, is in one P of P's worth. Uh, and, you know, work it out. And it's, it is significant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ditto that each septic system would be enough to um, clobber the lake except that it's just stopped in the sands very effectively. And it and that's something that you kind of want to use the absorbed capacity of the sand rather than to put in a sewer system and all that, if it's there. And and it is there, it's just that it's not, you know, the, the thick unsaturated zone that stops the movement of phosphorus isn't there if you're right next to the shore, mm -hmm. you know? So how many houses are right next to the shore? I don't know. I, I said around that um, spreadsheet, which is it's just a snapshot of a yeah. spreadsheet, yeah. so it's kind of hard to work with. And it, I wonder um, that's one of the got. things that she said that this so updated have been, data made me the one of the things. The I mean, why didn't she send me the file? But I, I don't know. And I asked Melanie. I'd asked Melanie for that, and she seemed to think it was a lot of work to. Uh, somehow get it together. I could I ask her again, I could go over and take a look at it. And there have been updates and it's not completely up to date, but um, we could. I could just go back to, to Jane and, and say, you know, so why don't you send me the file? See what she's, I mean, you know, maybe the, if she could easily. We, Alyssa, uh, can you clarify, are you talking about, is the question how many houses are along the shore? No, how many septic systems? Oh, we that have that. So the youth group, uh, Jane does have this data, and I think it was also posted. The youth group went to the Board of Health and did a lot of work um, figuring out, on, and you can look at it. They did addresses on both sides, I think, like on White Avenue, right. for example. Well, that's what John so, sent around the picture of, but we just we just we were looking at the, the, the data, and that was only a snapshot. And oh, no there's, no, there's an Excel sheet. And it shows each property and what kind of system they have. And last time it was serviced, and the last time the Board of Health had the information. As a result of that, some people's um, the septic companies are supposed to report to the Board of Health. They didn't always, so people voluntarily gave that data. So when the kids did that, they amassed all that data. Melanie may not be; she should be aware of it. Susan Resk was still in charge then, but that data has the type, last service. And where the location is. 
I can get that if you want me to request it and send it to all of us. Yes. Okay, I'll take that as an action item. Yeah, and so I was just trying to scale it, right? So, so John's saying he doesn't think, you know, a lot of them that are a certain distance and or elevation from the bond probably aren't impacting it. I was just well, trying to trying to scale. Okay, so how, how many are we talking about here that right, aren't right. low enough and close enough? And so is that, an, I'm just asking the question because I keep thinking back to what our charge is. Do we want to wait for a year and get all our recommendations or should these be things we're putting into place right now saying, is that something that we base it on John's, you know, John's limnology experience or do we ask for an RFP for a study to um, confirm that hypothesis that it's only certain houses because that certainly would make a huge difference in in what needs to be done or what should be done other than all 50 homes or whatever they are. You know, being I, potential. I'm not at this stage convinced that as much study needs to be done as we had an effective system this year and um, moving into a more hypothetical kind of study may not get us something that's more useful. I think more useful recommendations are things like putting the porta potty system in Sachem's Cove, continuing the APOD kind of system and the um, the analysis that the Board of Health is doing. And you know, the other study kind of things that have been thrown around, like the sulfur cycle and 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 trying to understand this phosphorus um, may not be as useful um, in terms of coming up with the solution. And as I said, I think the solution may be more just continuing what we're doing and adding, you know, continuing to upgrade septic systems, putting in bathroom facilities in other places and other times of year. So I don't disagree with what you're saying, Alyssa, but we have talked in the past in the town had talked in the past about you know getting betterments for different systems better systems if john's hypothesis is correct that takes the onus off of you know 30 or 40 betterments so i i think we still don't know enough last year we had a win but there's so many factors that do impact this and i'd also say the other one of, and, and Evan, I know we're going to get to this, you know, these other committees that we need to be sitting in on or they need to sit in with us. One of the things that people, and I think Delia will mention this, they they don't even want to put garbage cans down in Sanctum's Cove because it's it will get out of control collecting it. So putting a porta potty there, does that just attract more people to come and, you know, use the pond when they're not supposed to be swimming to begin with? So I think we got to think about the big picture. And I'm just saying that if if John's hypothesis could be proven somehow, why wouldn't we want to know six homes on the north side are the biggest impact for us? That's like a lot easier to work on and manage than 35. That's all I'm saying. Right. I don't know. So the, so the data on the septic systems is what's what's a good thing to study, where the septic systems are that are old or and or close to the pond, rather than doing a detailed study of phosphorus in groundwater. Oh, yeah, no, places. no, I'm saying to try to prove that just this north side is the culprit. We can get the septic data, but then how do we study that to prove that might be the, the, the real thing, right? That's all, that's all. So when I think of recommendations and requests for funding or anything like that, that we want to get more, um, you know, more concrete data. And we talk about EES, that's a 2015-16 study. Do we need additional? It doesn't have to be EES. So I, I, I think of things we were going to recommend to the town and the select board about what, what should we be working on trying and what do we need to get there? Because there's many things. I don't know, Jen or Evan, I mean, I'm not sure what else. Any thoughts? Because I yeah, think we I think, need to start thinking of recommendations. 
Yeah, I think we start to build. I don't think I'm ready to make a recommendation on this yet, personally, but I think this is certainly on the list. And I think, I think kind of in the near term here, we start to build a list of things of possible recommendations and requests. Um, and then in relatively short order, sort of give some of those recommendations. Uh, but I think I'd like to do a little more sort of investigation, talk with some of the other committees and, and kind of build a little bit more of a, a list to see if we have if some other priorities, maybe higher priorities evolve through those conversations. Right. Yeah. That's what I mean. That's exactly what I'm thinking. We should start yeah. making a list of potential things we're going to ask for. We don't have to ask for them right now, but let's start putting those on paper as a working list. That's yeah. exactly what I would okay. suggest. Absolutely. So how does the list work? Is it just uh, going to be in the minutes and we have to go back in the minutes and pull them out? Or I mean, is there um, is there actually going to be a piece of paper that's got that, that is the list? I'm just kind of I kind of because I've been kind of wondering, you know, we're going to meet for a year. And, you know, various points will be made and then, you know, six months will we remember <laughs> what it was or, you know, how. How do we have have a, a continuity that way? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, you know, that's like the vision document wasn't that we just said uh, one day we came up with that. We had all these things that we managed in a like I'll call it a parking lot. What I do in business, so you keep those things somewhere, and we keep one person responsible for keeping them, so we can have that as our our working our working potential list, and we probably should revisit them each time because something will come up higher or something additional. So I think we should, that's one suggestion. One of us will be the, the repository for that. Agreed. I, I have one slide here, I, for, I guess three slides, um, that show a lot of work that the USGS did on phosphorus on Cape Cod at a Schumann pond, looking at the uh, sewage that was dumped in the ground from 1936 to 1996 or something like that, 1936 to 96. Uh, so it was dumped up in these square um, infiltration basins up here. And uh, then a Schumann pond just kind of went belly up, a lot of uh, green stuff grew in it. A lot of cyanobacteria blooms and so forth. And we wanted to determine uh, a model that would tell us, you know, how this stuff moves through the aquifer. Well, that's what this grid was, is a model grid, it's a three-dimensional fully reactive transport thing. And it has, you know, all kinds of uh, chemical equilibrium and so forth in it. And here's the results we came up with. So we ran- and I'm sorry, those- the septic infiltration systems. These are the these squares. are not septic. These are um, our infiltration basins where they just dump the sewage, okay, on the ground. And it, you know, so it's sort of like a septic system, except uh, except it looks a lot worse. I can show you what it looked like. Sorry, I didn't get rid of all this stuff, but. In the lower right hand corner is the pipe that comes out and shows how you know it just dumps out on the into an infiltration basin. And there's sort of the bloom, the plume groundwater plumes that come out of this thing. But anyway, my point is that we were able to model this um, and find out. Uh, so on the left-hand side are measured um, contours of phosphorus in the groundwater, and the right-hand side are the modeled uh, results, and they're pretty similar. Um, uh, and this, in the model, the simulation was just, okay, if we dump these different amounts from 1936 on, you know, what happens to it uh, chemically? And you can see that uh, in the in the one direction, let's see here. The, uh, the phosphorus is sort of stops right here. And so if they just loaded these beds over here instead of the ones closer to the pond, they never would have had a problem in the pond. But because they had loaded 
um, the ones closer to the pond, uh, it went right into the pond. But my point is that I could use this model at White Pond to see what the effect in, of changing pH conditions is uh, from the septic systems that are close to the pond and those that are further away from the pond and see, you know, if the model predicts that the stuff would get to the pond or not. And, you know, if that's if that's of use, I could do it. Um, probably gonna do it anyway, because I'm curious about it. <laughs> and uh, so we're getting into useful. it. Yeah, sounds really cool. Yeah, because we, we don't know where are, are the septic systems a major part of the problem or a tiny part of the problem or yeah, not pretty, part of the problem at all. For sure with the pH thing, if you, you know, switch the pH of the precip, it'll, uh, the aquifer will sort of act to negate that change because of buffering capacity in the aquifer. So it's like, how do you gauge that? You know, how do you know when you've been putting in the new pH uh, um, precip long enough that it's having an effect in the aquifer? And the model could help with that a lot. So, uh, so, but just qualitatively, I'm thinking the stuff that's closer to the pond is going to be the most important. So that's why I'm making these recommendations for going after the closed stuff first, because it's kind of like, it's going to get there. And aesthetically, it wouldn't be a bad thing to do, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's elevation, it's proximity, and it's direction of the groundwater flow? Right. If, the, if it's flowing... If it's on the side of the pond where it's flowing out, it's not going to be an effect. It's not going to affect the pond. So I would. Uh, and the general trend is from the beach towards Sage and Pond, right? For groundwater yeah. flow? Uh, east, east to west. I think it's more north to south, but. Uh -huh. you know, I, I thought I the... uh, John mentioned clockwise, actually. Does the currents in the pond? Right, I, I had that one. Yeah, I, it was map. Yeah, I out. but any, I mean, yeah. not. Yeah, that was it, just it a, was shared before. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, John. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else on on this one to cover tonight? That was um, not really I, the suggestions I had. I could. Um, I, I I just stuck on a. I, I wrote up, and I could just send them over to you or something. To, Put in or what? I mean, that could be on the list. I don't know. Perfect. Is there any merit in showing the septic data to you, or do you want me to send it to you? I just grabbed it. I had it in my file. I, can you send it around to everybody? I can send it to everybody. I didn't know if you wanted me to pull it up real quick, if it would help with this discussion, or review and talk about it next time. Next time. I think probably review. I think we saw a screenshot maybe of the of that spreadsheet yeah um, sure. but yeah so I, I think it'd be great if you could send that around yep i'll send it tonight thank you um since this is my first time taking minutes um what's the procedure i i send them with the next meeting information you can send them to send. to me and or beth you can send them to me okay um you can and then I can type them, or you can type them, or I'll type them. That would be terrific. I um, would, yeah, I would type them and send them to both of us, and then Evan, yeah. you and I can just one for, one of us red lines first, and then the next. Yep. So we'll typically scan them, make sure everything we had is is in there, and then mm -hmm. uh, and then we pull them together to send out to the broader group prior to the next meeting. Okay. Uh, terrific. All right. So other. I was just going to say, other than going over the septic system data next time, is that a meetings discussion um, to go over her list, or should we start thinking about our list invitees and inviting? So that was the next item on the agenda. So I sort of done some brainstorming of you know some meetings we want to attend, or just kind of who are all the stakeholders around the pond. Right, so these sort of urgent recommendations is one part of our charge, and the other is how does the town manage this 
going forward. Um, right. So in the past, it was White Pond Advisory Committee. Uh, and now that's on pause, and now it's White Pond Task Force. And the question is, is a White Pond Advisory Committee the right body to do that? Or is there some other mechanism that the town should be using or create to just sort of ongoing management of the pond so we don't have to create a, a one year task force? Um, and so I, you know, some of the things we've talked about is okay, let's. Who are all the stakeholders? What's important to them? How do we, as a task force, interact with them? So, do we invite a certain person to our meeting? Who is that person? Do we have contact with that person? Do we go to their meeting? Uh, do we send out a survey? Um, do we do an open forum? You know, so, so who are the stakeholders, and then what's the best way to communicate with them? And do we know who the contact person is to just kick off that process? And then we can prioritize. And and start to get those interactions scheduled. Um, do I have a bunch on my mind? I can kind of start. Might be easy if I just start running through those. Um, and then, if there are any others that that people think of, either think about it for next time, or if you have some on your mind right now, you can throw them up. Um, so in no particular order, a bunch on my list, I had NRC. Um, so certainly Delia, the primary person there, and we know her well. Um, so probably invite Delia to one of our meetings. Uh, Dover property, or I'll just run down kind of real quick. I'll just sort of run through everything I had brainstormed. Uh, Dover Property Owners Association, Neighborhood Association, the Friends of White Pond, uh, the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, Board of Health, Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, Recreation Commission, the Trails Committee, Select Board, Town Manager, Fire Department, Police Department, Planning Board, Water Department, Public Works. Are there other pond associations in town? Is there anything at Warner's or Nurse Neck or anything like that? Um, Climate and Sustainability Committee, Wastewater Planning Committee. Those are sort of anything I could think of as potential stakeholders for the pond. Are you, Evan, are you sharing the screen? Um, no. Just reading, okay. Is my yeah. I yeah. see a, a recommendation stock like that. Did you have okay. friends of White Pond on there? I do. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. I stopped sharing. Sure. You can share. Um, I am not online. I cannot. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, but why don't, we, why don't we take friends of White Pond? So, so Beth, that's a sort of a Facebook group. Um, it's actually um, more than a Facebook group. They're meeting, uh, in fact, they have a meeting next week. I can be the liaison for them because I already tried to sit on some of the meetings. Uh, they do, there is a Facebook page, but there's also a group of people starting to meet on a more regular basis. I think when I was gone last week, there might've been an article in the, um, the bridge as well about some of the things they're thinking about and working on. So I can, if we're looking for yeses or nos, or if these are all pertinent groups, I can certainly volunteer for that one. And I had already volunteered, I think, for the Board of Health one, if there's something on the agenda that would be impactful, because it's not always related, right? right? I mean, do we want to divide and conquer? Do we want people to come to our meetings on a regular basis or do we go to all theirs? I mean, Mary's on the phone too. She might have some input. I yeah, do. So I, think, I do. Yeah, I think that's exactly. <laughs> I want to sort of brainstorm, you know, who do we know at these committees and, and what's the best way to interact with them? I, I think it's going to be hard to get people to come to your meetings. I mean, staff um, is different. They usually feel an obligation, but to get volunteers on other committees to 
then ex do more volunteer work, come to your committee. Um, mm -hmm. You need to reach out to them. They don't really need to reach out to you if, yep. you, you, if you understand what I'm saying. So I think um, in that direction, it should be you going to their meetings and basically just telling them the work that you're doing. And it's more, it's much more of an awareness is what I had in mind mm -hmm. when I wrote the charge. Um, yep. And I would also just recommend that you, it, you balance it more towards uh, committees outside of the White Pond watershed, because there's a lot of committees in White Pond that um, I think you need to get more people in town involved in what you're hoping, in, in especially when you have your recommendations, if they involve uh, spending money. Yep. Because the select board, remember, we don't have any money. You know, any money that you get has to come from town meeting, one way or the other. So the more um, awareness you have uh, among the rest of the town, as far as what you're trying to protect, uh, then the more successful you'd be. Does that make sense? It does. Good. But I'm not sure, like, um exactly what you're getting towards it seems like you're saying we need to establish a structure that can better uh run white pond or accomplish the objectives of white pond and we're and we're and we would get we do uh what 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 structure would that be i mean i don't think we're going to get there by just going to other people's meetings i, I don't see how how we get from one to the other. So, so I'm, I think historically, it, my impression from the general town is White Pond, the people in the White Pond area, and I'm including myself in this, became kind of a little nimby faction that complained a lot and wrote a bunch of letters and put things in the Concord Journal and uh, and like, look, there's stuff going on all around town. You guys aren't that special. And I think the communication is kind of fractured um, over a long period of time. Um, and I think so. the task here is, okay, let's put a pause on whatever's happened in the past. And then how do we rebuild that so that the pond is a town resource. It's not a resource just for these handful of houses that happen to be right next to it. So how do we manage this pond? How do how does the select board hear about it, get recommendations on it so that they can that the town can can act on sort of the needs of the pond? So sort of what does that body look like? Yeah. Um, and, and so the thought was, okay, let's who cares about the pond? Let's find out who those folks are. And so that's sort of what this dump of all these different committees and and commissions uh, sort of was. And then think about, okay, do they have an interest in the pond? Are they a stakeholder there? What would they be happy about? What would they not be happy about? Uh, you know, what direction would they want to see it go? And and even get input as to how they would want to be apprised of things going on there, or how they would want their voice to be heard and kind of throughout the rest of, of town. So it's a little bit of an abstract challenge, certainly. But I think so I was sort of thinking, okay, all right, what are the first steps? Let's find everybody that cares about the pond and, and goes in open communication with them. Because I don't think that's happened for a long time. I, I just went to uh, the meeting on Warner's Pond, and that was run on by natural resources and a consultant that was trying to kind of work out the, the future of that pond or what the possibilities were. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems like the, the way things happen is that um, maybe at town meeting, there there's a, a program to say, okay, let's uh, uh, get a consulting group in to determine what uh how best to manage the pond and, and what how the changes should be and then 
and natural resources card sort of uh, works with that consultant and uh, you know then puts options back to the to the town about what they can do. I mean that's that's kind of what happened at at Warner's. Um, so I've not been present, but I would guess there was a number of conversations. Yes. Prior to that, right? So before it ever gets to town meeting. Yes. There's years. a whole bunch of conversations going years. on. Several years. Yeah, and then a program. Then they and they had money from from town meeting, right, to do the work. Over like several over several years. So I'm sorry, I keep interrupting, but it, that was a long process that took several years. And um, we're, I think we're coming to the end of it, I hope. Um, but it, again, it was a lot of communication around town to get people interested, to get people on board so that when these articles come in front of town meeting, they're actually approved. And this will be hopefully the last step, but we'll see. But I, my point is, is that there's a lot of groundwork that has to be done to get other people involved and to get the funds um, really approved so it's our objective to um to do all the work of getting to town meeting with a with a plan no no if i i think it might be helpful to reread the charge once in a while um because i really am hoping I, it's and i think evan said it really well I'm, I'm i'm the select board is hoping that the this committee gets an awareness around the entire town of this resource and I think the fact that the Rec Commission now um, manages the beach is helping because a lot of people use the beach, so they're aware of that. But it's more than just the beach. And I think that um, going to meetings is just one way that you can get town committees um, on board with uh, what the work that you're doing and, and to hear from them as well. So it's more, it's really just an, an awareness of what the work that you're doing, and I mean, you don't have any, you don't have any um, recommendations yet. You don't have anything concrete to bring to them, but you're just letting them know that you're working on it. And um, anyway, I'll stop. <laughs> so I think it's sort of twofold. One is right. Are there super pressing, urgent things that we need done now, right? And and that's a set of recommendations we can deliver throughout the year or at year end. But it's also okay. This is a one-year task force we've all signed up for. What happens on January 1, 2024? Right. And so we want to have some sort of a body in place or recommendations of what that body would look like. Yes. To carry on this work going forward and continue to get recommendations, continue to monitor these things, continue to kind of be the voice of the town for the pond. And is that a white pond specific one, or is it a general town of Concord ponds, right? Do we sort of merge with the Warner's Pond folks? Uh, are there folks there? I don't know. Are there people that are Nurse Knack Hill Pond, right? Is, do you form kind of one larger, what's the health of all the ponds in, in the town, right? Uh, who's sort of from the town is kind of watching Walden, or is that all just state people? Just no, it's just that they're they're so there are you you're just talking about such completely different ponds. Um and yeah, so this is sort of what I what I don't I don't know. I don't know how all these different ponds are being managed or are they at all? And should there kind of be an overall ponds committee that is looking at all these these different things? I don't know. I mean, that's one possible thing to come out of this at, at year end. You know, what does that what does that body look like? You know, it was initially set up as white ponds, but does that scope get increased? I don't know. Yeah, Could I ask, um, someone's sharing their screen and, and I can't see you all. I see a PowerPoint slide on my um, monitor. So is there some way that that could be, there you go. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Well, do we want to start the way Beth said and, and, and get a liaison to each of these committees that you mentioned and get a volunteer to go to the appropriate one and say, here, here we are. 
I mean, I, I, yeah, right. And and for each one, maybe it's you know, do we get ourselves invited to their meeting? Do we just show up at their meeting? Yeah. Do we know who the contact, contact is right? Yeah. So that that may vary depending on which which entity we're talking about. Um, yeah, I don't know. So maybe we just sort of. I mean, I'd I'd be willing to take on uh, Bruce Freeman and the Trails Committee. I, mean, I think I can find folks. Let's see if I can talk to them. I'll do Board of Health and Friends for sure. And I think Alyssa, one of the questions you just asked is. Um, we can ask to be put on their agenda if you want to say why we're why we're attending. You know, all of us can do that. Just have two minutes to say here. I'm from the White Pond Task Force, and whatever. And here's here's what our charge is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but the Board of Health just that because that's a little that's a town staff thing, and they have lots of their own experience and stuff. I was wondering if that would be something that we'd want to have them talk to the whole committee about rather than. Um, reaching out, I just I'm throwing that out. She, I mean, she's I think, got all that data that she had from. She was the one collecting the data from last year, and they know their staff resources and um, mm -hmm. a little bit of the history of septic systems on the pond and all sorts of things. Yeah, I think so. If we sort of establish uh, who's going to be kind of our task force liaison, and then we can figure out what's the best way, and you know, that person can sort of be in charge. Mm -hmm coordinating what's what's the best way to have that initial outreach yeah i mean we can invite them we have invited them in the past uh they have conflicting meetings too because they have to attend many <laughs> themselves but uh when we see the agendas one of our tasks as volunteer liaisons to these committees is to check the agenda and see if it's something that impacts or could have an impact so if board of health is talking about septic permits that might be a meeting i would say i'm going to go to and listen And so Can you read some of the throughout. other ones, Evan? I mean, did anybody take NRD? I mean, that's a really important one, obviously. NRC? Natural Resources Department, Natural Resources Commission, either one. We definitely need someone there. Happy to do that. I'm an ex member. Yeah. Okay, Alyssa, uh, you just are on three committees already. <laughs> Don't overburden yourself. It's easy enough. Um, I think sort of prioritizing. So, uh, Mary, how do you think it would be best to interact with the with the rec department? The rec commission. Rec commission. The commission. Yeah, yeah. I do. Uh, how how would we go about? But I'm would... happy to take. I'm happy to take that one. That would be great. I I uh, contact the chair. His name is Phil Griffith, and um, you know, just tell him what you'd like to do and get some time on their agenda. You want me to send you his contact info? Please. We'll do. Uh, do you think it's worth talking to Fisheries and Wildlife? That's a, that's a state entity, right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I already, um, I already am in contact with Mr. Todd Richards, so I guess I can keep that because uh, Jason Stolarski, his assistant, was the last person who sent an email about how, why they're going to continue. So I, I can continue with that. Okay. And then, um, is there a climate sustainability and a wastewater planning committee? Did I did I get those right? Do those exist? Well, the DPW handles uh, wastewater. Um, uh, you know, honestly, Evan, I don't know if that's a worthwhile conversation. Uh, <laughs> DPW in general. 
Yeah, well, and I don't mean that in a in a derogatory way. I just mean that. Yeah, no, I, 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 this is well, exactly the conversations we want to have. Well, I thought the one interesting time. thing about the DPW is the question has been raised a few times whether withdrawals from the town wells are impacting, and I think that's something that be, should be a conversation with DPW because they would be the people that would know that. That's a good idea. But how about if I mean if if uh, if there were to be a, a package plant or something like that to handle the sewage from a couple of residences, you know, wouldn't the um, wastewater uh, planning committee have to be involved? Or I think that would be a board of health decision as far as whether they would approve those those uh, the DPW really handles just the public. Um, Sewage treatment. Well, was, weren't they involved in? I thought. I thought we discussed before that uh, Alan Cathcart would be the person who would know the history of the last attempt to set up a package treatment plant around the pond. Yes, he would. It, I think we've covered that ground a lot. Is what I'm saying. I uh, and you're you know, Alan is always willing to talk to whomever. So. I'm not, it might be good to talk to him personally, as opposed to the, I'll let you decide. I'd, I'd be happy to, to talk to uh, Alan, because I've, I've talked to him before about other water issues and stuff. I'd be, I'd like to catch up with him. Terrific. You got it. Mary, are they also responsible for the roadways, right? Yeah, they are. So that would be another important part of that, because you know, yes. the erosion and drainage and all that. So not just septic. Exactly. Yep. Stormwater. Right. So you're thinking of talking talking with Alan, not going to the DPW commission. Is that accurate? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Yep. Town manager, would that be worth a reach out? Let me give that some thought. I think when you're further along. Wait on that. that. That might be a good conversation, but right now I know she's very aware of the work that you're doing because she was there when we wrote the charge. So um, it's premature, I think, to talk with her. And the select board as well, wait on getting on a select board agenda. Well, you're going to be delivering your report to us. Right? Are you, yeah. you, are you thinking you want to talk to us before that? Uh, maybe. Just. Yeah, uh, maybe just kind of get specific is just ask questions or what's what's on your mind regards to white pond it might be well i think that we wrote down what was on our minds in, in the charge um okay. it, you know it's good to come to the select board if you're looking for a decision a concrete okay. decision yeah How about uh, fire and police departments? Police probably for security, right? I mean, yeah, and also that's who you were supposed to report when um, the former chief attended our meetings. He encouraged people to to call, not to be afraid to call about both parking issues and um, you know fireworks, fires, loud noises on the beach. So we have a new we have a new acting police chief. His name is Tom Mulcahy. So right. it, I think this is really good time for you to start to connect with him. Okay. Uh, I, I can I can reach out to police and fire. Good. Uh, this is a DPW we covered. 
Um, water department. That's DPW. That's DPW. There you also. Yep. Planning board. Be worth talking to them at all. Uh, the planning board's work is mostly regulatory, so they simply look at applications and see if they fit the bylaws and and apply them or make adjustments through the ZBA. So I, I don't I don't think it could hurt if you just go there and talk in the public comment section of the meeting, just to, again, give them awareness. But as far as having an interactive conversation with them, um, or as far as you know, being on their agenda, I I I, I don't see it a good use of, of your time. Mary, just as a, a note, and you and I spoke about this briefly, in the past, they would run by the White Pond Advisory Committee permits, people would have to present to WPAC permits that would work like, you know, screened in porch or a deck or an addition or anything else with the properties that were, you know, within 100 feet. I don't know what happens now that White Pond Advisory Committee is no longer, but that was one of the things that did happen in the past. That was done as a courtesy. Um, so there's no there's no reason for that. There's no bylaw. There's nothing regulatory that the planning board would enforce. Um, it really was a, a long, long standing. Um, thing that happened that was put together as a courtesy. So somebody there will be thinking about that impact to whatever, you know, like for instance, one was a two bedroom septic. They wanted to do something crazy. And then, you know, we said, nah, and then they actually said no anyway. Okay. So somebody will be do looking think, at it. Yeah, do you think they would have said, they wouldn't have said no if it hadn't gone through White Point Advisory Committee? I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I really don't know. Okay. I mean, well, we would give our blessing or not. That was maybe all. maybe that's worth a question to the planning. I would ask the plan. Well, I was going to say planning and land management, but they're going through a big turnover right now. But uh, if you wait a month or two, you could certainly ask them that question. It's, the staff, it's because the staff, it's, the staff yeah. not the planning board. The staff. I would ask staff. No, exactly. That would be the town people because I don't know if they had a checklist that they went through. So, all right. Maybe in another yeah. month we can come back to you and you'll know some names for us. I I have some names. They're not starting until April though, so let's get you know. Let, yeah, yeah, in a month or so. Good. Yeah, sounds good. good. Yep. And I don't know. Have you seen all the surveys that are floating around around town? There's a survey about Warner's Pond. There's a survey about the rec strategic plan. There's a survey about the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Are you people aware of that, or is that just something that that doesn't get a lot of? Um, no, I think it's well advertised in town. Yeah, I got a postcard, yeah. and with the um, QR code, and could take the survey for um, uh, Warner's Pond. I haven't done the diversity one yet, um, but I think that I thought that was pretty easy to participate. Interesting. I didn't get a postcard. I did. I got postcards. It, it's well. We have to know what the questions are in a survey, <laughs> and 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 doing a survey is that's not balanced. That's not biased in any way. Is it's a very hard thing to do. It is. It is. And I'm not. I'm not suggesting that we do a survey that would we would base any hard decisions on. I think it would again. It's more a survey to get awareness. Like, are people aware of White Pond? Do they use it for trails? Do they use it for, you know, do, just do they use it for um, swimming? What do they use it for? What are some changes they'd like to see? Are they aware? Of, anyway, I'm making it up for you. But it's not, it's certainly not scientific. The the, the responses you get are, are not going to be as valuable as the awareness that you plant in the um, in the community. Yeah, one thing about going to all these established committees and so forth is that we miss uh, people who are sneaking into White Pond to go swimming. And 
there's a substantial population out there uh, that do that. And how do we talk to them? <laughs> or the fishermen. I mean, what? Or the fishermen. Well, the yeah. fishermen. So how you know um, who who will get their point of view? And and you know they're going to keep doing it. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I have some good friends who are, you know, fine people and they're like, you know, yeah, I, I go down to the swimming beach before the lifeguards get there because I don't, you know, I'm not a member of the, of the committee and I, I, I've been doing it for, you know, 20 years and, um, you know, how that, that population that feels that that's a right that they should have. Do we need to talk to them or anything? Yeah, I'm not sure about this, but I think they might have a right to do that because it's a great pond. And that's something that you need that- Questionable, I, what, whether swimming is allowed in a great pond. Is, okay, well, then that's something that I think there's a lot of um, misinformation. So clarifying that I think would be really valuable. <laughs> yes, I mean, that just yes, to, it just be. to get the legal thing or to talk to, I mean. To get the legal thing is because I, I do know that there are many people who think that because it's a great pond, um, that means that, they, in other words, they could go in through the um, the driveway that the, swim, the fishermen use, and they have every right to do that and every right to go into the pond. So that's a, something that maybe you want to look at. So, look so great ponds, you're allowed to fish foul, and one other thing, but it's moot on swimming. So there's been many years of discussion in Concord whether swimming is allowed. Right. There is no access, um, but so but the question of whether once, once you've gotten access through some legal means, such as taking a boat down to the ramp, yep. if you went swimming, it's I, that that question has not been resolved in the town. It's been decided, you know, they said you can't swim from the from the NRC land. But the um, Bill Holden uh, and when the Rangers were told that they could tell people not to go in, this is the cove, not to go in. But if they are already in the water, they really had no jurisdiction to say get out. So if they got in already, you know, what are they going to do? But I think, John, your point is well taken. Um, we uh, we did try, we had a couple of like, I, I don't want to call them round tables, but we put up a little tent and we met in a couple of neighborhoods and just asked people to come and comment. It might be interesting if we could get on a day that's hot, some of us there and just start questioning people. I And maybe what we, I don't know what we'd hear, but. I've seen the rangers tell people to get out of the water. They all get out. And when the ranger leaves, they all sit on the side and they go right back in. So people do feel they have a right. And if there's no um, consequence for them going in, there's nothing, you know, to hold them. And these are old and young. So it would be interesting to get their opinion somehow, but it's a good question. How do we get it? I mean, or or could this be, you know, a survey, uh, questions in a survey that was town wide? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't yeah. know that people there even live in Concord. Okay. Well, I didn't know exactly. My kids, when we lived in Sudbury, you know, every kid who went to Lincoln Sudbury knew a way to get in through the back way. And it was, you know, let's go swimming at White Pond. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's more than just local. I wonder, Mary, or and everybody here, is there maybe we should be having the discussion once the rangers are appointed and invite them to one of our meetings and kind of talk about it maybe they can ask some questions or because they're the enforcers i don't know what the plan is i know they're planning on hiring but maybe we can have a discussion about that with the rangers not sure what information we could get but we could certainly ask the rangers to come and report and tell us what they've been finding and seeing and doing because we've never done that i think that's a good idea I think you should go through Delia if you want to do that. Oh, oh yeah, totally, yeah, go, totally. Go yeah. 
Well, who did, do we have a volunteer for natural resources yet? Yes. Yeah, Alyssa took that. Oh, okay. So maybe Alyssa, could we ask if, um, you yes. know, when you do go or talk that understand the ranger program for this year and maybe we could have them come and talk to us sometime? Yeah, probably better after it would be later, you know. You are, yeah, sure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But it'd be a good way to get some data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Who hires the Rangers? Delia. Delia. You know, just throwing out ideas, you know, we talked about a table somewhere and you know, I was thinking, oh, it's Earth Day or something like that, but Barrel Farm. Um, I wonder if you set up a table at Barrel Farm since um, you'd get a lot of people who would be there going swimming or something. I mean, it's just a proximity kind of thing. Someone no, that's to... actually a good idea. And even at Agriculture Day, they had all sorts of different committees there. Not that we're agriculture, but you can go listen, <laughs> have, a, have a booth, really. Yeah, yeah. And that I gives us no... Yeah. Kind of, that's kind of September, October-ish. Put a table on the Bruce Friedman Trail might be a good place. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Right under Powder Mill Bridge. Are you taking their bike into the pond or not? <laughs> Is that everybody on your list? The Dover property owners, I assume you would. Yeah, I can do that. Um... Mary, is there a climate and sustainability committee? And is that something there is? There is. Um, they were merging or something like that? The, yeah, two committees merged into one. So there's one big committee now. Um, but they would certainly be worth talking to. They're much more involved, I think, with technical solutions like solar and heat pumps. But this is certainly an environmental concern that, uh, well, yes. I would certainly be as far as awareness, yes. They're not naturalists, they're much more technical people. Mm -hmm. And you're going to the chair's breakfast, right? Yep. Good. Yeah, we're that's rotating. Great. That's great. Evan, I can't, you some I know it, I can't go this week. I'll be in Belgium. Yep, I can cover that. Thank you. Um, and then in the last one I had on my list was, and we sort of talked about it, was the other ponds. Who are the sort of the bodies that are overseeing these other ponds, if, if any? I don't know of any. They're all neighborhood. Um, Water has got an advisory uh, committee. A concrete advisory or is it state? It's state. But the pond is in concrete. Yeah, it'd be good just to go and hear what are there. And I'm on the committee. Challenges. I'm on the, the uh, advisory committee. So, oh. yeah. All right. Ready? Okay. Um, And then like a nurse snack or McCone or Warner's. So Kennedy, no, no, there, there's no central, no, it's all pretty scattered. Last thing that Walden did was uh, get uh, design for a, a um, the accessibility trail, just the same as it's happened at White. Um, and, you know, it's down to, because it's another kettle hole, it's a steep cliff that comes down to it. And they have to have a, a back and forth uh, thing to get the gradient right and uh, need to chop down 50 trees and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that was all going ahead. And um, then the money for it was cut by the governor at the last moment. 
that that was that was going to happen. <laughs> kind of interesting though, because it's so similar to yeah. the situation that happened in white. And the, the two groups never talk to each other. You know, they have many of the same issues. Uh, how do we keep from getting too many swimmers? How do we, you know, on and on. But uh, yeah, the state is one. They also have stock trout. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, and, I don't know. It's kind of interesting to me to. That's I, I like being in both, uh, seeing both uh, uh, lakes and yeah. what they're up to. That's what I got on my list. So one thing. Uh, sorry, I've been to interrupt. Do we have shouldn't we have somebody who kind of figures out about the state i mean they own the greatest portion of the pond is there somebody who it should be trying to investigate more on that end or should we put that as one you mean like dcr i don't know who it is that be, i don't know enough that's why i'm saying shouldn't we have somebody if the state owns the biggest portion of the pond What's their stake in this? What's the rules? What do we need to follow? What can we, I, I don't know. I'm just asking. The state is a big unknown to me. Uh, yes, to, we should. Well, why don't we, can we, Evan, could you please kind of recap what ones we have and how many people so we can kind of divide and conquer so we're not overloaded on, you know, things we got to work on? Yep. Thank you. Yep, I'll, I'll compile notes from this conversation. But can you just real quick go over? We have like, we have about 15, yeah. just so I know. You got it? I got it. Uh, all right, so I got NRC, Alyssa, Dover Property, Evan, Friends of White Pond, Beth, Bruce Freeman, Alyssa, Board of Health, Beth, State Fisheries and Wildlife, Beth, Rec Commission, Evan, Trails Committee, Alyssa, Fire and Police Departments, Evan, DPW and Water John. DPW Waters John. I think John DPW is more than just water too, right? It's Walden. I said DPW and Walden. Walden and roads too. Yeah, Walden. Okay, yeah. thanks. And so open. Um, climate and sustainability within the sign, and then uh, legal research, and the sort of more general state ownership of the pond. I can send you the legislation on great ponds. And... Yeah, I've I've read that. To, I I was thinking more, Alyssa. Like, is there a contact person? I mean, that would be just actually understanding the facts. It would almost be like I would want to invite that person, if we could find that liaison, to come and talk to us about it. I don't know, John, you may know too from your experience at Walden. Obviously, they have a state has an impact there. That's a DCR that runs Walden. And D DCR, I mean, DCR is is the people who are have oversight over great bonds, but... When I say they have oversight, I don't mean that they actually do anything. Um, okay, yeah. So are we? Do they do they oversee Walden and White Pond in the same way by not doing anything, or are they more involved in Walden? Well, they run the state reservation around Walden and the visitor center. So they, so they have, have a know, different kind of impact. That whole property that used to be county facility in the county. Uh, gave it to the state or something. Hmm. 
I would just be interesting because as Mary was indicating, what is, you know, if we make some rules, are there rules that would be oppositional to what the state demands, like people coming into the pond, right? So it might be interesting to get some facts about this. Anyway, that's my thoughts. And I don't know enough about it. So it'd be very interesting. And we have, Carl is in here tonight and we have Jen and Carl. I mean, maybe, is there anything, you know, there's other, if, if we want to split up and divide some, anything else that's of interest? Um, I can talk to the climate and sustainability. Unless okay. somebody has already taken that. That one was open. Okay. Great, Great. thanks. Think about the uh, the state situation of Walden. I guess anyone can can walk in there and swim without paying. Uh, it's only if you park your car that you would get assessed the charge. Mm -hmm. So that would be an interesting thing with uh, Bruce Freeman. Um, where people could walk in, and they and it you know. And you, but you but you can't swim from the town land yeah. or the Dover properties, which is what it was <clears throat> for Freeman. Well, why can't you at Walden? <laughs> it's probably it's public state land. So you, well, it's public land. I think you can't They find... do actually set up rangers blocking people walking who've parked at the high school or Ferryland. Yeah, the, the, the parking they control, but not for walk-ins. I said they set up rangers sometimes standing in the corner. That's if the parking lot is full. So it's all about the parking lot. You can get off the train tracks and go swimming from that end. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, but well, not. Yeah, and, sure. And again, yeah. you know, they would not like to exceed the capacity of the pond, and they it's kind of assess the capacity by when the parking lot is full. Yeah. That's and that's when they kind of try and stop people everywhere. But if the parking lot isn't full, you could come in from anywhere. And you can ride your bike, you can walk in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, I mean, they have a lot of traffic issues with, you know, with the whole parking lot business and yeah. putting up all those uh, things that keep you from parking on the side of the road and you know, like that. Yeah. Next agenda item, any other business? Any public comment? Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Good work. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned.